Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 30th of June, 2023. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So before we jump into the news uh, for today, I did want to give just a quick kind of shout out here or a kind of quick PSA here for people to prevent themselves from getting scammed. Now, I'm sure a lot of you see discords uh, for different projects getting hacked from time to time and uh, these various phishing links being uh, kind of shared in these discords as if they were coming from the moderators or the project team itself. And usually what happens is that this is a, phishing link and you go there and you interact with it and then your wallet gets drained. So I just wanted to give a PSA that you should never click anything that is shared just out of the blue by the project teams like this, especially things that ask you to connect your wallet and sign transactions uh, and interact with it in any way with your wallet. You should definitely double, triple, quadruple check things even if it seems legit. So if they do like an announcement in the Discord channel that that there's like some, some airdrop and you can go claim it at such and such URL, I would cross-reference that with other social media channels that the project has. I would cross-reference it with the actual team members themselves, like multiple team members. And I would also make sure that the URL you are on is the original one of the project. Now, of course, there's no way to f to completely protect yourself because if it's a very sophisticated attack uh, and for some reason the hackers were able to get access to the legitimate website as well as uh, many different uh, accounts that are of the uh, the project team, then yeah, I mean it's going to be kind of like very hard to to kind of verify the the legitness of of a link. Uh, but generally, that those are the I guess like quick tips I can give to avoid things like that. But on top of that, there are also other things out there that can protect you from this. I have talked about the Safe Wallet app uh, firewall feature that. I highlighted the other day, there's the fire extension uh, as well. Uh, there is uh, a few other things out there as well that will help you, uh, um, you know, um not just for MEV protection, uh, but they do uh, other sorts of protection as well. So yeah, just generally don't let the FOMO kind of take hold when you see this and make sure that you don't click uh, links that look at, at, at all suspicious, especially ones that are asking you to interact with them with your wallet or download anything onto a computer. Just general kind of security tips there for you. So I just figured I'd give a, a shout out there because it's quite common that a Discord channel would be hacked and all it really takes is for one of the moderators to be hacked, right? Um, and one of the moderators to, for some reason, maybe not have two-factor authentic Authentication, and then they get hacked or some other, some other such way. And then the hacker can obviously have mod privileges on the Discord channel and start sharing stuff and sharing fake links and, and things like that. And I guess I, I don't expect myself to to get hacked or my my um my Discord to get hacked. But if you ever see any kind of like airdrop or anything in the Daily Gray Discord uh, channel get linked by me, you know 100% it is fake because I've said before, there's never going to be a Daily Gray token. I'm never going to do an airdrop of anything. So if you see that, uh, definitely do not click any links there. Uh, but anyway, Anyway, moving on to the news from uh, the last 24 hours. So a few uh, Coinbase updates here. So Meta Lawman, well, I guess Coinbase versus SEC updates. So Meta Lawman put out a tweet today, uh, basically starting off by saying, the lawyers for Coinbase have come out with an interesting opening move in the case. Uh, and then he says, this is going to get complicated. So you can read the full uh, tweet here from Meta Lawman that explains this. But basically, uh, Coinbase uh, filed that, um, that response the other day that I went through. I think I, I talked about it yesterday or the day before the response where they basically responded to every a single one of the SEC's claims against uh, uh, against um, uh, against Coinbase, I should say, sorry. Uh, and Coinbase uh, obviously included a very lengthy response there as Meta Lawman uh, says here, which is kind of unusual for these things. Usually the um, response is like admit to something or deny something, but uh, what Coinbase has done has gone above and beyond. And I think what they're doing, and, and, and Meta Lawman outlines it here, Coinbase appears to be using this this creative strategy to get documents helpful to its cause in front of the judge through the answer. So through the answers, they basically uh, uh, expand more than just saying admit or deny and add extra context for the judge to look at to see and, and strengthen Coinbase's case. But you can read Meta Lawman's tweet to get the full context here. I just wanted to highlight it for you guys. Uh, Jake Chavinsky also has a really great tweet thread here all about uh, Gary Gensler and how he is not an impartial uh, person uh, in, in most of these SEC cases, or pretty much all of them, uh, against crypto, and he should recuse himself from these cases, especially the Coinbase and Binance ones. Uh, and Jake actually provides a very convincing argument as to why this is the case in his thread, so you, you should go check that out for yourself. But it's not just a thread, it's also a post from the Blockchain Association here that was put out and can be actually used by 
lawyers that are either um, you know defending uh, different companies from the SEC or actually going after the SEC for various different reasons. Uh, and you can check that out for yourself as well. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. And just last up here is a tweet from AJ Warner who said, and for those of you who don't know who AJ is, he um works at Offchain Labs, uh, the development team behind Arbitrum, but he put out a tweet saying, the amount of resources that Coinbase is putting into their legal defense to make sure this is done right and no stone remains unturned is incredible. I understand that in many ways, this case could be ex existential and clarity from both a legal and policy perspective is necessary for them to continue, continue to succeed, but it's also important to recognize and appreciate that they're in many ways bearing the burden and costs for all of us right now. Thank you, Coinbase. So I think this is Re a really good point here and really true. And I've said it before, Coinbase is really putting the hard yards in to defend not only themselves, but the crypto ecosystem at large. Now, of course, as AJ alluded to here, Coinbase is doing this in part because it is a big issue for them. If the SEC wins this case against them, it could potentially uh, destroy their business, right? It would, have, it would have a lot of effects on their business, but it could potentially destroy it completely and just make it impossible for Coinbase to operate profitably in the US and they'd have to go offshore uh, or completely offshore and they wouldn't be able to service US customers anymore. That, that's kind of like the worst case there. But at the same time, you know, Coinbase is also fighting for all of crypto and sticking their neck out for all of crypto and get trying to get regulatory clarity from the SEC and other agencies and especially Congress for crypto itself. And if they succeed, then all of crypto will be better off for it. So it's really great that um, that we have such a, I guess, values aligned company or crypto values aligned company such as Coinbase fighting for us. Binance is also fighting. And I actually do believe that CZ does share a lot of crypto values um, that, that a lot of us do, even though I've said before that I think CZ is a bit of a, a shady actor um, or, or traditionally has been and definitely a profit maxi. That, I, I, I believe that that is uh, true as well. But I do think that he shares a lot of those values. And obviously he wants to protect his business too. And he, he wants to make sure that Binance can continue to operate and, and thrive. So having these two juggernauts fighting for us and spending all the money to fight for us, fight for crypto at um, such a large scale, I think is really, really important and something that should be acknowledged. And if you know anyone that works at Coinbase or especially working directly to defend uh, you know, the crypto ecosystem against the SEC, you should definitely give them props on that and make sure that they are valued uh, for that there. But as I said, I'll link all this stuff in the YouTube description below and you can go check it out for yourself. So speaking of positive regulatory developments, uh, in the UK, we've had a landmark finance bill uh, go through that will recognize crypto as a regulated financial activity in the UK, uh, which was passed into law, giving it the final approval because it was signed by King Charles. It's always weird reading King Charles there instead of Queen Elizabeth. I, I, I kind of got taken aback by that. I'm just like, what? <laughs> but anyway, that was just that's just like a formality for what they do in the UK. And, and funny enough, fun fact, in Australia, because we're not a republic, the queen, or I guess the king, um, could, if he wanted to, reclaim Australia for himself in the worst case scenario. Uh, it would never happen in practice, but it's kind of funny that Australia is actually um, technically still under, I guess, like a monarchy uh, um, uh, kind of system there. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, it isn't. But anyway, that's a little aside there. Uh, but this is this is really positive out of the UK. The UK has actually been sending a lot of signals recently, um, positive signals with regards to crypto. You had the, the PM, the Prime Minister of the UK, I think his, his name is is Rishi. Um, he's been saying a lot of positive things about crypto and wants the UK to become a crypto hub. Um, I think that they're doing this for a number of different reasons. One, they're obviously taking advantage of the fact that the US is pretty hostile towards crypto and attracting new entrepreneurs to the UK to build crypto related products to the UK really do, is already a financial hub. So there is a lot of um, the existing infrastructure there. Three, everyone knows the UK left the EU, uh, you know, a few years back now, I can't remember the exact timing it was, but they left. So obviously they, they need to continue to innovate and make sure that they're continuing to be competitive on the world stage in terms of economic output, things like that. So yeah, a bunch of different reasons why I think the UK wants to be the crypto hub here and for them to, to already have passed something into law is a big deal because you know we want the US to do this. this is exactly what we want the US, US to do we want them to legislate we want them to pass things into law that give clarity for crypto but the UK is ahead here and you can read full details about this in the Coindesk article which I'll link in the YouTube description below all right, an interesting uh, announcement from Shopify today so Shopify CEO Toby here uh, shared a, um, a post or 
a dev portal saying, the blockchain team at Shopify did a fantastic job creating a new tutorial for how to build a token gated Shopify storefront from scratch. Using Shopify functions, Remix, Hydrogen and Wallet Connect, uh, you can now do this. So yeah, this is a, a, a basically a developer facing tutorial on how to do token gated uh, shop fronts using uh, Shopify here. And it basically, for those of you who don't know, Shopify is an e-commerce uh, platform that makes it an easy for anyone to set up their own e-commerce store. It's got a nice graphical user interface and everything like that. And they have um, this concept of, uh, I guess, like plugins uh, as well, where people can kind of download these plugins and it'll enhance your website or enhance your Shopify store and things like that. Well, with uh, this new tutorial, uh, developers can create things that, or, or, or integrate things into their plugins that will allow for token-gated uh, Shopify storefronts. So essentially, what this would ha what this would mean is that you would have like a token or an NFT uh, that is in your wallet, and then you would visit a Shopify storefront. You'd connect your wallet and verify that you actually hold that NFT or token, and then it would allow you to access the website itself, or access uh, certain areas of the website, or purchase certain products, or get discounts on on certain products because you you have that NFT or token. So that's actually really cool. And I think this is just a really nice marriage of like the web two world and the web three world. And Shopify has actually been innovating you know, within kind of blockchain and crypto for quite a while now. Uh, and they're not one of those web two companies that's kind of shunned it. They've actually embraced it. So great to see that from Shopify here. And if you're a developer, you can check this out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, so the DevCon Twitter account shared today that the road to DevCon 7 in Southeast Asia begins. So if you are located in Southeast Asia, driven by, driven by a community-focused spirit and passionate about organizing educational Ethereum meetups, uh, you can read on and find more uh, about the road to DevCon grants round, which will go towards supporting that. So I'll link this in the YouTube description below for you to check out if that applies to you. But uh, I don't think that there is a location that's been announced yet. Uh, so Southeast Asia obviously is the general location, but like the specific specific location, I don't think has been announced yet. I'm I'm not sure where this is going to happen. I've heard rumblings of things like uh, Vietnam and Singapore. I've said before that I don't think it would happen in Singapore simply because um, Singapore is too expensive uh, for for uh, and and generally DevCons try to be hosted in places where it's very accessible to people from all around the world. Singapore probably doesn't fit that bill, um, but uh, Vietnam definitely would. Maybe Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia would fit that as well. I think those two would be my like front run. That uh, they're, they're, they're kind of like the, the front of the pack for me in terms of the where they would go. Out of those two, I would maybe say Vietnam has more of a chance, but then I think about the fact that there already is a Vietnam Ethereum events. Um, I don't, as far as I know, there isn't a major Ethereum event that's ever taken place in Kuala Lumpur. I'm, I might be wrong here, but as far as I know, uh, there isn't. So maybe that'll happen as well. And I, I think that that fits the the bill of like in somewhere that the um, that uh, that Ethereum events haven't been before in an affordable place for people, or generally affordable place for people, much more affordable than Singapore, obviously, and still in Southeast Asia. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, that's the thing. Like, it could be anywhere, but the thing is, you have to think about like what a DevCon requires. It requires. Uh, access to good public transport. Uh, re it requires, and, and transport generally, it requires access, uh, easy access to people flying in and out, right? It requires a good airport. It requires uh, a, a big enough venue to host it, right? And a big enough modernized venue to host it because obviously there's going to be a lot of people going to DevCon. I'm definitely going to go. I mean, the fact that it's in Southeast Asia is just a bonus for me, but I was already planning on going to going to DevCon here. Uh, so yeah, I, I think yeah, Vietnam or Kuala Lumpur are probably the front runners, but we'll see. We'll see which one it is. Maybe I'm completely wrong and it's somewhere that I haven't considered yet, but maybe you guys know more than me here. Uh, so I'd love to get your thoughts in either the YouTube comments or the Discord channel. And actually on that note, um, I, I was talking about scammers at the beginning of the refuel. In the YouTube comments, there are so many scammers all the time, guys, like so many shills and just stupid comments. And I remove them as much as I can. But on yesterday's video, they basically spam the video with like 70 different comments comments. And I was like, nah, I'm not going through this manually to remove them all. I, I can't be bothered. So just know to ignore that completely. I, I think you, you guys know that already, but just don't click any links there or anything there as well. Um, and don't go to any of the things that they tell you to message. And some of them will say, or oh, message this person on Telegram to get trading tips. Don't do that. You're going to lose all your money, right? Uh, so yeah, just, just a heads up on that one there. All right.
right. So uh, Elitsa here from the uh, 21 Shares uh, uh, company here has uh, an exciting announcement for us today. So they've built a new tool at blockdaemon.com slash Chappella, which basically allows you to calculate how long it will take to withdraw a certain amount of ETH. So you can see the calculator in front of me here. If you were to input 32 ETH and then submit, it will tell you um, uh, basically, uh, it will calculate Basically, the total withdrawal requ request is a combination of partial and full withdrawals, uh, partial withdrawals uh, and full withdrawals. So everything that's currently um, uh, requested, and then it will tell you the timer for partial withdrawals and and full withdrawals here. So this is really cool. I think that a lot of focus has been put on, put on deposits, deposit timing, you know, deposit queue, stuff like that, and not enough has been put on withdrawals. So yeah, this this uh, new resource from from uh, 21 shares and Block Damon and a bunch of other people worked on this as well is is very cool and and very important and you can actually go play around with, with this for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Um, I, as far as kind of like entering validators and exiting validators, <laughs> it's kind of funny. The the activation queue is 92,000 pending validators. It's 45 days long. The exit queue has five validators in it and it's three minutes long. <laughs> So it's just always funny to see like how literally no one wants to exit. And obviously this is due to a bunch of different reasons. I think that a major reason is definitely the fact that if people want to exit, they can just uh, uh, they can just sell their um, LST, whether it be ST ETH or R ETH or whatever else for ETH on the open market. But I think what people don't understand is that if enough LSTs want to sell, right? Well, okay, let me step back a bit. I think what people don't understand is that when people are selling LSTs, they're usually selling it for ETH, right? So there is always a buyer there for that. But if there is a lot of L an LST being sold, like we saw last year when 3AC was offloading their ST ETH into the, the, uh, into the available liquidity on chain, it would, I guess, like, it's not a peg, but it would make the STE trade at a discount to fair value, and it did. It went it went pretty low. I can't remember exactly how low it went. I don't think it went as low as zero point nine, but it got pretty close to that. Um, so you you essentially could buy um, zero point nine. Uh, sorry, one STE for like zero point nine ETH as an example, and then you could wait um, back then until the. I guess like fair value uh, until it got back to fair value. Um, and then you could make an arbitrage there. You could make a profit there. Now with withdrawals enabled, you don't have to wait. You can request a withdrawal through Lido or or through another LSD provider, whatever it is, and essentially arb against the beacon chain. So you don't have to arb against the secondary market. So what would happen is that if a big whale wants to exit and they don't care about slippage uh, and they don't care about um, you know, losing money uh, because of that, then and then if the discount went to like 0 0.98 or something like that, uh, you could basically buy the LSD ETH and then just arb it on the beacon chain. So it would very quickly go back to fair value anyway because a lot of people would be buying it, but then you could also just um, arb it with the beacon chain itself and you would have like a, a, a low risk kind of arb there, very low risk, basically. I mean, I wouldn't say risk free, but like extremely low, low risk on, on that front. So unless that happens, I don't expect the execute to really get very big. Uh, and it, I'm going to be, I mean, it's going to be very curious to see what the execute looks like in a bull market and what, uh, you know, what the, the total ETH stake look like, looks, looks like in a bull market. Let's say we're like 12 months into the bull market or like at the tail end and prices are going nuts. Uh, is the exit queue huge because everyone's trying to get out to sell their ETH or have they already done it on the run up there or have they just sold the LSTs for ETH and then the LSTs are at a discount and the exit queue is huge because of that? It's going to be very interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, but this calculator will actually be uh, very cool to keep an eye on uh, when that potentially happens. Uh, so yeah, great uh, to see that this was built out and you can check this out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, so Octant, uh, which is a new project built by the Gollum Foundation, has announced today that they're kicking off Epoch or Epic Zero uh, of their new initiative to donate $1 million worth of ETH to some of their favorite public goods projects. And uh, the community gets to decide how these funds are going to be distributed. Now, for those of you who don't know, Gollum is using, um, I don't know if it's all of their treasury, but a large part of their massive ETH treasure, treasury, I think 100000 an ETH, um, and they're staking it, and then they're using the staking rewards to fund. I don't know if all if it's all of the staking rewards, but 
a healthy chunk of it to fund or give back to public goods within the Ethereum ecosystem. Now, I think this is a great outcome because for those of you who don't know, Golem was one of the first ICOs. And because of that, the ETH price was really low. So they raised a lot of ETH before ETH went nuts because it was based on like the dollar value, right? Uh, and there were a few projects that did this. And because of that, they've been sitting on this massive treasury for ages. They were waiting for withdrawals to be enabled. And now they're staking all of that ETH, um, I think as part of their own staking operation. I don't think they're using a, a third, um, an existing third party. I think they, they spun up their own here. And the rewards, obviously, they're going to be using some of it to fund the development of Golem and, and other such things. But I think they want to use a lot of it to fund public goods within Ethereum. Um, so that's what they're doing here. And this is a start, $1 million worth of ETH uh, as part of um, Epic Zero here. Uh, and in this special round of funding, you can choose from a curated list of 10 different projects, which are listed here. Um, and this is a pre-launch event. So the distribution of uh, Octane's Epic Zero reward pool will take place outside of the Octane app. Instead, a gated snapshot poll will be conducted to determine how the $1 million worth of ETH will be divided among potential potential beneficiaries. So you can go check this out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But great to see that, uh, I guess, like an OG Ethereum project that raised a lot of ETH is doing good by the community, right? It's giving back to the community uh, and, and using that massive ETH treasury uh, for good rather than just cashing it out and riding into the sunset like a lot of projects from the ICO mania did, unfortunately. All right, so we have more details around Polygon 2.0's architecture that was shared today. So you can see here that Polygon 2.0 has been designed to provide unlimited scalability and unified liquidity, thus transforming Polygon, Polygon into the value layer of the internet. So you can read the blog post here or keep scrolling to see what this architecture looks like. So it's basically split into four different categories. You have the staking layer, the interoperability layer, the execution layer, and the proving layer. And this is all broken down in, of course, the blog post and also the tweet thread, but you can check out the image here for a, a quick breakdown. So you've got the proving layer at the top, which is basically everything got to do with uh, zero knowledge stuff and ZK VMs uh, and proving uh, out the proofs for for those sorts of things. Then you have uh, the execution layer, which handles a bunch of different things like peer-to-peer -peer and syncing, interoperability layer, which handles the passing of messages between the different ZK VMs, and the staking layer, which is obviously the, the stakers that handle the, um, uh, the, so the validators that handle the uh, things like data availability management and stuff like that. And obviously all of this kind of settles down to Ethereum as the, the kind of L1 there, as the the ultimate settlement layer uh, at, at the um, at the end there. So there is much more detail in the blog post and the Twitter thread. So I'm not going to try and read through it all. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm super excited about Polygon 2.0. Uh, you know, you guys know I'm an advisor to Polygon. And I'm not just saying this because I'm I'm an advisor, of course. But I think that the L2s are converging towards this architecture of. We're going to build out this thing, right? We're going to build out this tech stack, and then we're going to get people to build with it, whether they want to build their own you know, app chain or whether they want to build on a generalized chain, whatever they want to do with it, they're going to have the tools to do that. And then also making sure that it can be a plug, have plug and play interoperability. Everything can talk to each other. There's a choice of where to store your data. So you get choice over like how expensive it is, uh, how expensive your, your deployment is and everything like that. So giving them the choice while also allowing uh, the, the teams to just use Ethereum as that settlement layer so that they don't have to pay out exorbitant costs for settlement and and basically devalue their potential tokens, I think is really, really important. Uh, so it's it's great to see this being built out and detailed here. I'll link information about it in the YouTube description below. Uh, and Sandeep, uh, one of the founders of Polygon, also has a tweet thread about this where he explains, or a couple of tweets about this where he explains a bit more about it. So you can check that out and I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so an update out of the base ecosystem. So they said here, security is an essential part of bringing the next million developers and billion users on chain. Uh, we're sharing how we've approached security, how we're preparing for a secure mainnet launch with internal and external security audits, and how we draw on Coinbase's best practices. Now, there is a tweet thread and a blog post uh, to, to, to dive into, which I'll link in the YouTube description below. But there is also a, another tweet. So they quote tweeted their own tweet, they being base. And they said, in case you're keeping track with the completion of these audits, we've now fulfilled four out of five of our criteria for mainnet launch. And there was a tweet that came from 
um, uh, that came from uh, Jesse Pollack, one of the the leads of, or I guess the lead of the base efforts, where he basically said that you that we can expect base to come out potentially this year, right? To, to hit mainnet potentially this year, which is huge, guys. Like I, I can't begin to describe how big I think it's going to be that base goes live with all the existing L2s that are already live, all the ones that are evolving. Um, like Polygon 2.0, 2.0, things like the OP stack being built out, Arbitrum doing their L3s, and obviously Arbitrum uh, 1 continuing to grow, and then EIP P4844 hitting mainnet, and costs coming down so much, and then going into another bull market next year, which is my personal opinion. There's no guarantee of it happening, but I think we're going to get another bull market next year, or at least the beginnings of the bull market leading into 2025. I just can't begin to tell you how exciting and bullish it's going to be for L2s generally. They're going to be cheap. They're going to be easy to use. They're going to be uh, integrated with all of the existing infrastructure like MetaMask and other wallets and stuff like that. Um, there's going to be lots to do on there. Demand's going to come back. Uh, the fees are going to remain cheap on them, especially on things like Validiums. I'm not talking about just rollouts, but Validiums as well. And there's going to be a world, uh, for, for new, uh, world of things uh, for people to do and, and on top of all that, uh, Base is going to bring on a shit ton of users who have never used any on-chain products before because Coinbase, in my opinion, is not going to list a lot of assets from now on, if any, really. So if they want to keep that market share and keep that um, that kind of like business on Coinbase, what they're going to do is they're going to basically have an asset listing page or an asset information page on Coinbase.com. It'll say, this is such and such asset and give some information about it. And then it'll say, it's not available on Coinbase.com, but you can trade it on base. And then it's going to have a breakdown of how people can bridge their ETH to base and then trade that ETH for tokens on base. And the tokens on base will be all the ones that aren't on, on Coinbase. And that's going to bring a crap ton of users on chain, just like what Binance did with BSC. Um, uh, Coinbase is going to do with base. And I'm honestly stupidly bullish for that. I, I really do think people are underestimating how bullish that is for uh, just Ethereum generally and getting people on chain because I've said it before and I'll say it again now. I don't think people just buying crypto assets on exchanges can be considered a crypto user. They're not using crypto. All they're doing is speculating on the asset, right? Like you buying Apple stock is not you using an iPhone. Like, and maybe you use an iPhone at the same time as buying Apple stock. But if all you do in the Apple ecosystem is buy Apple stock, you're not using an Apple product. You're not using an iPhone. So it's not it, it, it's not the same thing. Whereas with or Ethereum, for example, if you buy ETH and just have it on an exchange and and, and and you're not staking it, you're not using ETH, right? You're not using Ethereum. But if you buy ETH and you bridge it onto Ethereum and you start doing Uniswap start trades or putting it into money markets or buying NFTs and stuff like that, well, yeah, of course, you're an on-chain Ethereum user. You are using Ethereum. So I'm, I'm pretty like adamant about that. I, I don't think that, because so, a lot of people say, oh, they, you know, we have like 100 million users in crypto. No, we don't. <laughs> we don't because they're not using crypto. They're just buying the assets. And most of the time, they're only buying it because it's been going up and it's been in a bull market. So no, that's not users. Users are people who actually use the products and services that are built on chain, uh, whether they use it through a centralized intermediary or use it on their own through their own wallets. doesn't matter. But as long as they're using the products, then they're users. If they're just buying assets on an exchange, that's not being a user in, in my opinion. Um, but I guess like, just to give a bit of a counter argument to that, people will say, well, these assets do act as store of values and do act as, um, as kind of like hedges against inflation. Like, okay, yes, but at the same time, if you buy ETH or BTC and you only keep it on a centralized exchange to custody it, then how can it be a, I guess, like asset that you're using as a hedge? Because you're still part of the centralized financial system by storing it on a centralized exchange. For you to actually get, become a sovereign individual, I guess, uh, with, with um, in, in terms of being able to hold and control your assets, you would need to withdraw your BTC and ETH to their respective chains. And by doing that, guess what? You're now a crypto user because you have a wallet. You withdrew ETH. You, to withdraw that ETH uh, or BTC, there was an on-chain fee paid, and now you are a crypto user. So that, that's the bar, really, to me. It's not, it's not a high bar, but that is definitely the bar because just storing your assets on a centralized exchange, you don't get the same security guarantees, even if it's the legit centralized exchanges. But withdrawing them to your own wallet and self-custodying, that's, that's uh, in my opinion, using um, you know the, the, these kind of like products and services as well. 
All right, last up here, speaking of wallets and self-custody, uh, Soul Wallet introduced the Soul Wallet smart contract design today. So they said here, this will be the foundation of our ERC4337 smart contract wallet that ensures permanent user ownership while enabling the benefits of account abstraction. This is for the Ethereum community. Now there's a nice graphic here that you can take a look at uh, for a breakdown of exactly how this will work. But then they also detail this in the um, the Twitter thread here, uh, which is not that long, but it gives a lot of uh, detail tell about what they're actually going for here. And for those of you who don't know, Soul Wallet is an account abstraction focused wallet. Uh, I am an investor in them, just a, a disclosure here. Um, but they are definitely building something really cool. And uh, you should go check out their uh, smart contract design uh, Twitter thread, which I'll link in the YouTube description below. Uh, but that's it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. I mean, I'll catch you all next week as a solo refueler, but tomorrow you can expect the episode with Eric Connor and I. So look forward to that. Uh, but anyway, thank you for listening and watching.